Hi there, this is Ian Rolf. We're in Arctic Norway at the end of winter in the Lingen Alps. We've been driving along this fjord. There's been a snowstorm. The light is poking out. We want to chase it. We drive ahead 30 minutes till we can see the sun. The snowstorm is catching up. We race out into the field. There it is, colors bursting in a beautiful array of pastels. We set up our cameras and I take six shots. I want to work from one hut to the other and with all that detail in between. So six shots in the bag, I'm ready to do the panorama. So we take the six files that we shot for the pano into Photoshop. It opens in the Adobe RAW converter. On the left side there's a film strip. We see that we select all and then we merge to panorama. It's interesting to note that we can start doing the edits once we've saved the merge. Once we're happy with how our panorama looks and whether or not we use all the boundary warp or part of it. Once we save that file, we can start working on these edits. So we click save and Adobe Camera Raw starts building the file. It's important to note that shadows, highlights and whites are the first things that we should attempt to control, followed by contrast, maybe exposure, followed by our temperature and even our tint. The next thing is looking at gradients. We want to get the overall feel of the image. So gradients are important, as is the adjustments of the tone of the gradient that we're working with. It's also handy to look at how vibrant we want the photograph. Sometimes we're drawn to warm colours, particularly at either end of the day, and it's important to adjust the saturation sliders for each individual pano that we work on. This is important for our emotional well-being too. We've shot as an emotional thing. We then want to follow through with the color and the tone. A little bit of clarity often helps to just bring out the finer details. Once we've done all that and we're happy with the sliders, we can open it in Photoshop. Now once the photograph's been opened in Photoshop, best to zoom in and check for unwanted clutter, dirt spots and any other aberrations we don't want in the photograph and work on those. So spot healing brush tool is one of the most important things that we can use as we work our way through the image. It's of interest to note that your spot healing brush tool in working images like this is probably one of your most important tools. Now 
we zoom out and the next thing I want to check for is how straight our image is. Often we can't straighten the image with just a ruler tool. We need to use the warp tool to just do final adjustments, remembering that often our panoramas can cover 180 degrees of view and we need to just straighten it so that it looks good to our eye. This can take a little bit of time. The warp tool is powerful, but we can overdo it very quickly. As you can see here, we can move the image far too much in any direction, up and down or left and right. So it takes some skill to get this to work really well. As you can see, we work the warp tool into the different corners of the image to just get that horizon looking as good as we can get it. You'll also know when you do panoramas that some will, some will take a lot more work than others, particularly if we're photographing such as this fjord and it's coming round a corner it will be up and down to some degree. Once everything's okay, just tick the box and the warp tool will do its work. Bring the image down, use the rectangular marquee tool to check your horizon. And you can see clearly when we look at our overall image that we've got it nearly perfect as far as a horizon line goes. Something we couldn't have done with just the ruler tool. This is probably a good time to check any unwanted objects and subject matter in your photograph. In this particular panorama. I don't like the footprints going into the middle of the actual pano. So using the brush tool again, I will get rid of most of that. And it's a good idea to use that tool first, followed by the clone tool. Be very selective with your clone tool and never use 100% opacity because you want to blend gently. And you can adjust the opacity as you work the image. As you can see here, we're just toning that out beautifully. Right, so now we're looking at the overall image again, and we're now going to do some finer details. I like gradient on both the top and the bottom of my image in most cases but it's important again to choose what sort of gradient tool so in the basics the foreground to transparent is the most natural looking one and the one that I would use 95% of the time make sure your family of color is in keeping with your particular image and you can see now I'm working the gradient just so that my eye is now drawn to the middle of the image. So whether it's a pano or just an ordinary image, it's great to use the gradient tool to draw the viewer's attention into the subject matter. We're now going to do some brush work. I never do cold white. I always start with warm white. So in your selection box, make sure you've got a warmer colour, it just needs to be a slight tint. And I use vivid light, but very sparingly. So the opacity levels will always be under 10%. You can adjust those up or down so that the image is worked slowly, but realistically. 
Now we have two dark objects in the frame. One way to bring them out is to use the magic wand tool. This is a powerful tool and if you enlarge your image so that you can just see the subject that you want to work on, you can then with the curves bring the darkness out to the gradient that you want. Dark spots are just as bad as white spots in your image and so you just need to lighten these off and the magic wand tool is one of the best ways to do that. As you can see now the red colour of the sheds is coming out just nicely without overdoing it. So flatten that Let's have a look at our overall image again. Now we can see that we use the warp tool a little too much. Not a problem here. We can then go back in and straighten that. Take the marquee tool all around your image, back into edit and the warp tool again. Now you can see I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to drag the bottom of my image across one point at a time till I get the reflections in the water straight again and of course the shed is straightening as well the image now becomes more natural and the way I want it doing good panoramas is a process of refinement and we often need to go back a little bit with our tools to get the image looking just fine so you can see now that those reflections are nice and straight. Let's now work on our brushwork again and a different part of our image. Again using a slightly warm colour we're going to highlight the clouds, those beautiful clouds that sit above the mountains on the far side of the fjord. Again remember your opacity is to be monitored very carefully usually 10% or less and vivid light is often the best way to go. You can enlarge your image as much as you want so that you can be more precise with the way that you bring in that beautiful vivid light little by little so that it still looks realistic and it glows. Again zoom in and check where else you might like to use a vivid tool. I'm finding the snow on the two boat sheds quite an attractive part of the image and I just want to brighten those areas a little bit. So you'll notice again I'm using vivid light, watching my opacity and keeping the colour slightly warm. We now go over to the other shed at the other end of the panorama and we apply the same procedure to that. Less is more. Always remember that when you're applying the brush tool. As we zoom out we can now see that rather than those two boat sheds being a blob they are now light enough to look good in our frame. I'm going back to the sky now, again with the brush tool, again using vivid light and again being very careful of my opacity. I want to make that sky glow a tiny bit more and I'm using the colours that are already in the photograph. Be very selective how you do it and keep changing your family of colour but only to the colours that you already see in your photograph. Here the sun is shining, we just want a little bit more glow on the reflection in the water and in the sunset itself. And finally that water looks good, so we can do two more things. We can get the family of colour that's in the water, a slight bluish teal and just very carefully stroke across there 
that looks good a little bit in the reflections as well and that's and the last thing I want to do is that sky so I'll go across I will change it to more blue now but again be very selective in how dark it is keeping my opacity down and I just bring the glow out in the sky that little bit and we can see now the overall photograph of both the warm colors and the cool tones has a certain glow about it which is something how I felt at the time that I photographed this panorama another thing I love to do is use Nick software which is a plug-in and I use it very selectively here I can see there's a little bit of structure in the clouds and the mountains so I overdo it I go into the visa and I overdo the structure on the whole image I then make a mask fill that with black which means then I can change my mode to normal and I stay off 100% we don't want to overdo it and then very selectively where I think some structure is needed I pull the brush through you can see how that just now pops not overdoing it just a little bit when you're happy with that you can flatten the image again finally white cool white there's a little bit of coolness in those clouds again using vivid light watching your opacity keep it well down and just pop through those clouds where you see the lighter bits this is what's making that image it's not only the sunset but it's also the tonal values of the clouds from dark to light when you do panoramas like this you'll notice that a, a variety of subtle changes is better than just trying to drag the sliders and boost it too much at one time a little bit of vibrance now followed by my levels very important pull it back to the pyramid and then bring your gray slider forward so that you've got that image popping that little bit more a final flatten and then we can do the image sizing oftentimes our files are far too large and in many cases when I build from six images I find that I can drop them down a bit to an acceptable size around 40 to 42 inches is great and I always make the vertical a little bit larger that looks great very happy with that back to the marquee tool click on that and I want to put a little two pixel stroke around it on the inside and a nice clean white so that when I go in to finally look at my image there it looks lovely with that stroke around it finally done I'm happy with that and I don't want to overdo it anymore thanks for watching this video please uh, hit the subscribe button and stay tuned because I will have some more videos coming out soon this is Ian Rolfe from Southern Lightscapes thanking you once again